Hello. In the year 2023, I read like 80 books, but today we're only talking about 24 because it's a celebration of 2024. You know what I mean? It's it's 24 before 2024. You know, we're ringing in the new year with 24 books. We're going to rank them from worst to best, starting with the worst book that I read this year and ending with the cream of the crop, okay? The best books that I read this year. So starting us off, the champion of the worst books that I read this year was Twisted Love by Anna Huang. Oh my god, this might be a contentious opinion. I didn't like this book. I gave it two stars and that was being generous, okay? Maybe it wasn't the worst, but it was the worst one that I'm willing to admit right here, right now. There's a lot to unpack here. I understand why people like this book. I, I get it. It's very much like in fashion. It's an on vogue book, you know what I mean? But also, what the fuck? It is a adult romance between a guy named Alex Volkov and then the female main character, her name is Ava Chen, which I think was interesting because the author's name is Anna Huang and like I'm not gonna posit any theories or anything but like mm, those names are really similar. Ava Chen, Anna Huang, oh my god. Are we doing a bit of self-insertion here? Not that that's a problem. You know, like, I, that's fine. That's totally chill. That's chilling with me. But also, hmm, it's really like the Anna and Ava that get me. Like, they're one letter off. But it's probably fine. It's probably, it's probably nothing. Okay, I'm probably crazy. Anyway, this book was just not for me, okay? Alex Volkov is like one of those s smart, domineering men, but he has the emotional capacity of a fish. And he, like, hates women, but he loves Ava which is just kind of sus to me. I'm not really into men like that. I buddy read it with my friend um, from work and we both thought it was just ass. <laughs> we, girl. Next up on the roster, second worst book that I read this year, Slaying the Vampire Conqueror by Carissa Broadbent. This is another contentious opinion, I know. I'm not a big fan of romanticy. I kind of knew going in that this book might not have been for me and I was right. I thought the main character, her name was Selena, was annoying. The plot didn't stick out to me. Like, I didn't give a shit. It was very action heavy and I wasn't into that. I thought the romance was nice and I thought the male love interest was nice. I don't even remember his name. It's like Arnold or something. I don't think it's Arnold. It's like Darius. I don't know what it is. The love interest I liked and I liked their romance. I wanted to see them have a happy ever after, but I didn't want to slog through the plot to get there. But I had to. Didn't love it. Better than Twisted Love though. I gave it three stars. Next is I Must Be Dreaming by Roz Chast. This is like a little graphic novel type book. Roz Chast is a New York Times comic artist and in it she kind of recollects some of her dreams like she um, draws them out and it was like a cute fun short way to pass the time but it wasn't that interesting. It wasn't that gripping. Some of the dreams were really funny but some of the dreams were just kind of like oh Okay. You know how like sometimes a friend will talk to you about a dream and you're like, I'm glad that you're interested in your dream, but I am not. Because to me, it sounds like a bunch of jibber jabber. Okay. That's what some of this book felt like. Number four worst book that I read in 2023 was The Diamond Eye by um, Kate Quinn. I think when I first read it, I gave it a 3.5, which is better than some of these other books that are ahead of it. But no. As I have sat with it, it really doesn't stick out to me. It really, it re like, it's very forgettable. The Diamond Eye is a historical fiction novel. Um, Kate Quinn writes a lot of these. One of my favorite historical fiction novels ever is actually by her. It's The Rose Code. I fucking love The Rose Code. And this is the first book that she has released since The Rose Code, right? It's like right off the back of The Rose Code. So I thought, oh, The Rose Code was really good. Maybe this one will be really good too. But it was not. It was kind of boring, kind of slow. The plot, like, it was interesting. Like, I, I'm a history fan, but I also didn't care. I think there's also a bit of a love triangle, which is a weird choice to make, but I guess it is something that could happen in history. It's, it's happened before. I lent my copy of The Diamond Eye to a friend and she never gave it back. And honestly, at this point, I don't want it back. She can, she can keep it. Next book is Ocean's Echo by Everino Maxwell. I read this on the beach. It was a beach read for me. I didn't love Winter's Orbit, 
but I had high hopes for this one because there were aspects of Winter's Orbit that I liked and I know that Winter's Orbit was her debut so I was like well maybe Ocean's Echo will be better but I had the exact same experience with Ocean's Echo that I had with Winter's Orbit. The first half I thought was really strong, really strong first half. The second half was like what the fuck is going on? What the fuck? Maxwell does a really good job at setting up like really mild sweet romances and her characters are always pretty compelling and I like the world that these stories exist in but the plots are just like not for me. This might be a bit of a spoiler so I'm sorry if you haven't read this but at the end of this book they start like flying around as disembodied consciousnesses through space and I was like this is too metaphysical for me please. What the hell is going on? Let's move on from that now because what the hell? The next book up is Freakonomics by I think like Stephen D. Levitt or something. Freakonomics is a non-fiction book about like economic things. It has like a whole bunch of anecdotes about like interesting stories and whatever. And like the stories were interesting. This was actually a reread for me because I read it when I was really young. I read it when I was probably in middle school and I didn't really understand it. I didn't really remember anything. So I was like why don't I reread it? And it was interesting to reread but some of the ideas that it presents aren't really well connected. Like it's kind of wonky how it all ties together. Um, and then throughout the book the like economist guy who you know has collected all this data is kind of touted as like a god. They're consistently like oh my god Stephen D. Levitt is like the best economist in the world. Girl. Get off your fucking high horse. It's a fucking freakonomic book you know like if you're really interested in economics check it out it wasn't really a standout for me <laughs> next we have devil in the dark water by stuart turton this is like a mystery thriller um historical fiction book i read this in november and i said that it has like a good amount of whimsy but also no i didn't love the plot i thought the ending was kind of lackluster i feel like for a good mystery the ending should kind of be like like mind blown and for this one I was just kind of like mm, all right that makes sense I guess but I'm I wasn't mind blown which was disappointing to me this one gets a, a C minus maybe a D plus next up is map head by Ken Jennings charted the weird the wide weird world of geography wonks this is another nonfiction. I had to read this for school and somehow this was still better than stuff like devil in the dark water it was kind of boring but it was funny and like kind of interesting and I feel like for a non-fiction book you kind of have to give it props for that. There were a lot of interesting anecdotes and stories and I feel like I at least learned something, right? Like a fiction book is always, is usually going to win out over a non-fiction book like this. But not, I don't know, MapHead was just, MapHead was just better. It was just better. If you love geography, you should check this out. If you couldn't give a shit. Don't even touch it. Next is The Dead Romantics by Ashley Poston. Mm, this is a the Good Morning America book club book. This is a like contemporary magical realism romance. The main character is like a book author and she or like she's a ghost writer. She's a ghost writer and she has to write books for this author. She like gets a new editor I think but her editor is really hot but then he dies and he comes back as a ghost and they have a romance. Um, it's like a small town cute romance. There's a lot of death and like ghost activity as I'm sure you could guess. It was a cute book. Problem is very millennial. Very millennial book. I'm not a millennial. I don't know who you would tell. I'm not a millennial. Like just the whole vibe of this book very millennial. I think at one point she calls a dog a doggo. And it's like I would do that if I was 12 but I'm not 12 anymore. And I'm also not 31. The main character wears like infinity scarves and skinny jeans and flats and it's like all right. It being super millennial isn't really a problem but there was definitely like a generational divide and I felt like sometimes I couldn't connect with it as much because I was like why the fuck is she calling a dog doggo? This one was pretty cute if you think it sounds interesting you should pick it up. We're getting into the books that I like at least kind of enjoyed now. Next up is Starling House. I actually read this this month. Starling House was just kind of mid. It's a fantastical but also contemporary adult fiction novel. There's a bit of romance. I thought the romance was really cute. I liked the main character. I liked the love interest. Um, I thought the plot really just kind of fell short for me and I feel like there was an obvious 
Like there was an obvious message and theme that this book was trying to dispense, I guess. And I feel like that fell short for me. And I feel like that's what really brought it down for me because I thought it was going to have such a like a more emotional impact and it really didn't. Like the ending just kind of felt like, hmm, okay, sure. Starling House was pretty good, but I did not, I did not, it did not eat. And I wanted it to eat. Next up is I Must Betray You by Rudus Ebedes. I have read all of Rudus Ebedes books and the only two that I really liked were Between Shades of Grey and Salt to the Sea. But I will say, I think I Must Betray You is her best since Salt to the Sea. That being said, I still didn't love it. I think I give this one like 3.5 stars. I think I've grown out of Sepetis's writing. Her writing is very juvenile. I think this is aimed at like younger, like tweens and like young teens. So if you have a child who's between like 10 and 15, they might really like this. But for me, it just felt a little too youthful. I thought the plot and setting was so interesting and fascinating. Um, this is another historical fiction novel about Romania in 1989. It's about like the communist regime and like what it's like living under that. Also about like rebelling against the communist regime. What really brought this book down for me was again the writing. It just felt very juvenile to me. Um, and then also the characters felt very lackluster. I don't know how old they were. I think they're between like 14 and 17. They're pretty young. They felt very one note and there is like a just a really bad romance in this book. Like, it's a bad romance. Um, there was a lot of thought and effort given to the plot and story and environment, but I think um, character-wise and romance-wise especially, this book was lacking. But otherwise, this was probably the best of all my three-star reads. Now we're moving on to four-star reads, uh, starting with All Systems Read by Mur <laughs> Mur Murder Wells, Martha Wells. Uh, this is part of the Murderbot Diaries. This is the first book. It's very short. It's like a novella. This is like a sci-fi mystery that takes place on a different planet. Murderbot is the star of the show here. I fucking love Murderbot. They are oh, my icon. Okay, I love Murderbot. I love Murderbot. However, the plot, mm, it left something to be desired. However, Murderbot's personality and general dislike and contempt for the entire world really helped save this book. But I just really didn't care about the plot, which was kind of sad because it's a short book. How are you gonna make a plot that's boring in a book this short? You know what I mean? First of my four stars, but not the best of my four stars. Next we have Chain Gang All Stars. Chain Gang All Stars was my favorite when I finished reading it, but after having like sat on it for a while, I just don't think of it as highly anymore. This is a like kind of sci-fi-ish dystopian future. Um, it talks a lot about how we treat prisoners, racism in prisons. This book has a lot of very heavy themes and I really liked a lot of the themes that it touched on. Like, oh, you don't want somebody who maybe killed someone to be released to the world, but you also don't want them to like be whipped and starved every day probably. And there were a lot of characters that I really loved. However, the two like mainest of the main characters, the ones that are talked about in the synopsis, kind of fell short for me. I'm gonna be honest, they are like a lesbian couple, but also their romance never really came through on the page. Like it didn't feel like a romance. I was like, where's the romance though? I mean, not that it's a romance novel, it's definitely not, but uh, you can't, like, the characters don't feel like they're in love with each other, which is just like, mm, I thought they were supposed to be in love though. So what's going on there? What's going on there? But otherwise, there were some really strong characters, really strong plot and themes and story. <laughs> it's just really those two main characters. Their chapters always drag too. I would recommend this book wholeheartedly if you're interested. Next up we've got Thorn Hedge by T. Kingfisher. This is another this is another teeny tiny novella. I think this one is shorter than Murderbot. I think this one's like a hundred pages. This one is a retelling of uh not Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty from the perspective of a fairy that is taking care of the Sleeping Beauty. The atmosphere here is really strong. The character work is really strong. For such a short book, the characters are intensely well fleshed out, like almost all of them. I thought this book was gonna be a lot darker. I read it around Halloween because I thought it was gonna be like ooky spooky, but it really was not that ooky spooky. It was like moderate, like it was mild spooky, okay? And that's fine, but it's not what I expected. And I think that's probably what takes this book down a little bit for me, but really cute, very fun, awesome characters. 
there's like a cute romance and everything like it's this one's worth the read also the oh the prose Ooh, the prose in this book is really good i was in such a fairy tale mood and this is like a fairy tale if you want a fairy tale oh oh read this next up we have time quake by kurt vonnegut this is half biography half fiction sci-fi story i'm a big kurt vonnegut fan i like what he writes. This one was interesting and fun and I liked a lot of the messages and themes, right? Kurt Vonnegut is big on free will and this book is definitely heavy in pushing that. This is a quote from this book that's like, we were put here on earth to fart around, which is just incredible. We're here on earth to fart around. So true. Anyway, this is definitely not his best work, but um, I enjoyed it for what it was. I liked a lot of it. I think a lot of it was very strong, so. Time Quake. Next up is Goddess and the Machine by Laura Beth Johnson. This was another reread. I read this a couple years ago, maybe in 2020. It's just a fun story. It's really not that, like, it's not a super serious book, but it's definitely fun. It is a sci fi YA with a hint of romance. Um, I reread this because I wanted to read the second book, which I also have, and I started the second book. The second book, I was not vibing with it. I was like, oh my god, take me back. Take me back to the first book. What the fuck? This one's really fun. If you're looking for like a nice, easy sci-fi YA, this one's good. It like it's not you if you take it too seriously, you're gonna be like, what the fuck? But it is fun. Okay, this is a fun book to read. I had fun reading it. There are so many twists. So many twists. And even though I had already read it, I forgot about most of the twists. And I was like, jaw dropped, jaw on the ground. I was astounded. Next is another book that I don't have a physical copy of because I got it from the library. And it is First They Killed My Father, A Daughter of Cambodia Remembers. Um, this is another nonfiction story. It's a memoir about a girl who grew up in Cambodia in the 1980s when uh, it was ruled by the Khmer Rouge, which was a communist regime and they like killed and tortured a lot of people, you know. The first thing killed my father was really interesting and heartfelt and like scary, but also a little bit helpful, you know, towards the end. It feels bad to not give books like this like five stars because it's like, oh my God, you lived through this horrible thing. And I'm not even gonna give your book five stars on Goodreads. What the hell? I don't generally like to give nonfiction books five stars unless they like are incredible amazing blow me out of the water awesome and this one was not necessarily that unfortunately but it was good and if you're interested in the more recent history of cambodia i definitely recommend it that's why i read it because i kind of developed this weird random interest out of the blue of like i need to know what happened in cambodia in the 1980s or maybe the 1970s i don't know exactly what happened okay i it was one of my first reads of the year okay i don't really remember total shift Daughter of Smoke and Bone, Lainey Taylor. This was a reread. I read this for the first time when I was in middle school and I remember not enjoying it that much. I definitely enjoyed it more this time. I think plot wise, it's really fun and interesting. Like it's well written. Like Lainey Taylor is definitely a, a fantastic writer. She's, oh. The thing about Daughter and Smoke and Bone is that it's very much a product of its time. It came out in 2011 and you can kind of like tell. There's a lot of verbiage that kind of equates skinniness with beauty and the main character Keru is like beautiful and different and like almost everyone is described as beautiful in this novel but like Keru is like beautiful and everybody else is like weird beautiful you know what I mean so it's very much like what's that thing like main character syndrome I don't know like she was a little bit mm. anyway this one really good story really good writing mm. interesting character choices also nice romance forgot to mention that it's really a romance novel like really much a romance novel this is a fantasy romance YA and I'm interested to continue the series but I'm not like jubilated at the thought you know what I mean moving on Morley Taylor the next best book that I read this year is Strange the Dreamer Strange the Dreamer again with Lainey Taylor oh my god the writing is so beautiful and whimsical like I think half the reason why this book was as good as it was was because of the writing I think there was strong character work and like um, the romance was really sweet. This is another YA fantasy. That's basically all that Lainey Taylor writes, YA fantasy romance. This is a forbidden romance and so is Daughter of Smoke and Bone. Um, so I, you know, I'm picking up a theme here that she really likes forbidden romance and fantasy worlds. Very strong writing, plot, pacing. Actually, no, I take that back. What held this book back was the plot. I think the plot was kind of weak here. Mm, kind of, mm. 
left me wanting more. I think the ending was disappointing. Um, and I read the sequel too, and that's coming up. The ending just didn't have me like, you know, on my toes. Like sometimes you read a book and you read the end and you're like, oh my God, I need the second one now. That wasn't how I felt. And I feel like she left it on such a cliffhanger that it should have felt like that, but it just didn't. Um, so that was weird. But otherwise, really good, strong writing. Good, good book. Good book here. My fifth best book of 2023 was Guards Guards by Terry Pratchett. This is part of the Discworld series. It's the first one in the Nightwatch sub-series. I've talked about Guards Guards before. This is kind of like adult fantasy. I I hesitate to call it adult because you could read this like in middle school or high school and have really no qualms or problems. Like it's not inappropriate. There's no sex scenes or anything. Um, but I f also feel like, I don't know. Terry Pratchett is really like a humorous author. He writes comedy really well. So this was like fun and funny and interesting. It just didn't really reach that like five star status for me. I really liked it. I thought it was very fun, but like it left, it left a little bit to be desired. You know what I mean? Like, hmm. If you have never read anything from Discworld before, I would actually recommend Guards Guards to be your starting point because I really liked Guards Guards and I've read some other Discworld books that I haven't liked as much. So Guards Guards. I would highly recommend if you are interested. The fourth best book that I read in 2023, Muse of Nightmares by Lainey Taylor. Yes, we are continuing with the Strange the Dreamer series. Muse of Nightmares is obviously the sequel to Strange the Dreamer. It continues to be a, f a fantasy YA romance. This one I'm putting above Strange the Dreamer because I think the plot was stronger here. Um, the plot was stronger. You find out a lot more about the lore of the world, which I think was really interesting. Um, Lainey Taylor's world building is immaculate in this book. Like it, it's, it's good in Strange the Dreamer. It's wonderful here. The writing becomes a little bit less whimsical, but I think that actually works to the advantage of the stronger plot. So this one, really good, really strong. Um, I highly suggest Strange the Dreamer as a series <laughs> duology. Check it out because I had to do check it out and look at me now. The biggest fan. Not really. I, I didn't even give it five stars, so neither of the books I gave five stars. And now we're down to the top three. Top three books of 2023. Number three is Hench by Natalie Zena Walscott. This book, first half, oh, I didn't like it. Second half, oh, you know what I mean? Like, oh my God. The first half was really slow and you do have to just like deal with that. But the second half, eight. It ate, it slayed, it came to play. This is a sci-fi kind of book. Um, it's definitely adult. I would not recommend this for younger readers. This one is also very millennial. Um, like the main character is very millennial, but it's like less pronounced than it was in the Dead Romantics. Um, but this is about a girl named Anna. She's a henchman for like super villains. Um, and she works as a temp um, before she gets injured by a superhero. And then she like starts this blog where she starts like documenting all the like damage that superheroes cause. And then she gets hired by a big, big, big supervillain. She works with him to like kind of stop the superheroes from... I don't know, doing their business. It was strong. It was good. I went into this thinking that it was going to be one of those books that kind of like flips the script where like, oh, the villains are the good guys and the heroes are the bad guys. But it wasn't like that. It kind of presents both sides as like, both sides are shit. Both sides are not that good. And that's interesting. Like, it's interesting to read from the perspective of. And then my top two books of 2023. These are the two books that I gave five stars. I'm going to start with A Study in Drowning by Ava Reed. This is like a fantasy YA romance. This is the same plot as Storming House, but for young adults. This is about a young girl who's kind of like down on her luck, like not in the best position in life. She's in school to be an architect, um, and then she gets this opportunity to go to this famous author's house and work on the house and like rebuild it. Um, and she goes there with another young man who is also from her school, um, but his job is to like, like write about the author himself instead of working on the house. It's about like fairies and family and love. And it's like, it's good. It's good. I gave it four stars originally, but the more that I sit on it, this one just gets better and better. Um, there are some books that again, you sit on it. It's like, mm, this is not as good as I think I thought it was when I first read it. But this one, 
the goodness just compounds over time. And I would highly recommend this to anyone who is interested. Check it out, finally. Uh, this is on the same level as A Steady and Drowning, I should mention, okay? These are equal. Notes from a Burning Age by Claire North. This was delectable. This was, ooh, this was delectable. I thought this was going to be like a total like fantasy story. It is not. This is actually a sci-fi that takes place on our earth way, way, way in the future. This one's dense though. It has a lot of writing um, and I loved, I loved the writing. I think the writing was so strong and really the vibe of it was just so good. But I would also concede that some people might say that the writing, the prose was almost a little purpley. It was almost purple prose, but not for me. Okay, not for me. So this is the story of a guy named Then, who he's, he's like a translator. He can translate our language because it's so far in the future that our language is dead. It's dead and gone. He can read like German and French that we speak today, but in the future are long gone. And then he gets hired by this like brotherhood that like wants to reindustrialize the world because at this point climate change has happened. The world burned. That's why it's called Notes from the Burning Age because Venn translates things from the Burning Age. It's, oh, it's so good. Then our narrator is kind of unreliable. Sometimes you don't really know what he's thinking, but also sometimes you do. Um, and once you like know what he's thinking, you're like, oh, oh my God. Oh, just so good. This one's good too. Honestly, I think this is my number one book of the year. I think this one, very good. This one's my number one. This one's number two, very close though, very close. Those are some of the books that I read in 2023 um, because again this is 24 before 24 going over 24 before 24. I read of course more books than that and there were books that I thought were worse and there were books that probably would have been in my top 10 that were also five stars that I just didn't include here. Let me know what you read in 20 what are your 24 for 24? <laughs> what are your 24 before 24? Anyway, Goodbye, au revoir, have a nice day, ciao.